Today I'm going to be watching this video, it's called 20 things only Americans do and think it's normal. So yeah, I'm not too sure what things only Americans do. Don't know if this is like a generalization, but I guess it'll be interesting to watch. If you're from America, you can tell me if you agree with these. If you think any of these are not things that you do. Uh, let's watch. All these outfits, dude. It's the only call. You know what I mean? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 things only Americans do. Get a ton of shit. For this list, we're looking at common beliefs and practices in the United States. They don't need to be exclusively American, just something that Americans are known for. If there's something uniquely American that didn't make our list, unite in the comments to state your picks. Number 20. Refer to the USA as America. America. Outside of the United States of America, referring to the country as America is much less commonplace. After all, there are two entire continents called America, comprising like 35 distinct nations. Referring to only one country on one of those continents as America too is really confusing for anyone who doesn't live there. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Calling it the US, USA, the United States, or just the states is much more common in the rest of the world. Even so, everyone still calls its residents Americans, which isn't confusing at all. You can't say it, but you know it's true. <laughs> Number 19. Yeah, I call it, I think I call it America. I, I call it all of those actually. Do Americans actually have a preference for what you prefer the country to be called? If you're from America, if you're from, I just said, if you're from the USA, what do you actually call it? USA, America, US. I guess probably most people just use all of them. It's an interesting thing. I've never really thought about it. It just comes kind of naturally for me to say America. I don't know if it's different being from other countries. Maybe in the UK, we just say America. Uh, but yeah, interesting. Throw gender reveal parties. Cultures the world over have traditions to prepare expecting parents and celebrate the expected birth of a child. Thank you so much for throwing me this baby shower, girls. I feel so welcome to the neighborhood. Of course. However, Americans have really taken the concept and run with it. An entire industry has been built around baby showers, as well as their modern relatives' gender reveal parties. Emerging in the 2000s, the latter have become infamous for sometimes absurd levels of showmanship. Mm. Some over-the-top reveals have been responsible for injuries and even disasters. They remain somewhat controversial, with many people, including Americans, not really getting why they're often made into such big deals. I don't know why, but I'm like, gonna I'm cry. Gonna... Oh my gosh, why are you gonna cry? Because really I'm just really happy for you. You look like it. You, have... you look like you're happy. <laughs> Number 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me what you think about gender reveal parties. They're definitely becoming more common in the UK as well, but there's still a lot of people who just don't like them. I generally am not for them. I don't really care about them. I've had two children. I would never have a gender reveal party because I wouldn't want to burden people to come to a party just to find out the gender of my child. Like, who cares about that? No one else cares about it. I don't even really care about it, I just want whatever comes out, whatever's there I'm happy with, so it's like almost inviting people against their will who really wants to go to a gender reveal party. Have you had one? Have you been to one? What's the craziest story of a gender reveal party you've heard of? Uh, but yeah, it's an, um, definitely I think an American thing in its origins, but it seems to be becoming more popular in most other countries as well experience huge bathroom stall gaps. Restrooms have their own quirks, like different sinks and toilet bowls. The US is known for having a high volume of water in their bowls and large gaps in their bathroom stalls, both under the door and between the door and the walls. Hmm. Visitors can be taken aback at the lack of privacy. Some hold that they're designed for easy cleaning or construction. Others that it allows one to check which stalls are occupied, although occupancy indicators on the locks can do that too. Maybe so you can see if there's someone in there. Isn't that why we have locks on the doors? Well, <laughs> as a backup system, in case a lock is broken, you can see if it's taken. A backup system? It might also <laughs> make it more difficult to get up to no good in there. 
Whatever the case, public bathrooms in the U.S. are built for speed, not comfort. Would you just sit down and go to the bathroom already? <laughs> Number 17. Have pharmacies that sell groceries. In most of the world, pharmacies sell exactly what their name implies, pharmaceuticals. While you will see tangentially related items like grooming products or hygienic things like toothbrushes, pharmacies don't usually carry food or toys. But in the U.S., that's much more common. The country is all about the all-in-one experience. Not only will dedicated grocery stores have pharmacies built in, but pharmacies will also carry groceries. Granted, the selection isn't always great, but if you're desperate for milk and the grocery store is closed or you just don't feel like crossing the street to get there, you can get some. While most of the world still limits drugstores to drugs and self-care products, we have a feeling this one might catch on. Number yeah, that's something that does confuse me a little bit. It's something I just never knew would have existed before I learned about the USA. And I've heard that some pharmacies actually sell alcohol. Is that true? Have you ever been to a pharmacy in the USA that sells alcohol? And just tell me what you think about pharmaceuticals in America in general, like the power of pharmaceutical companies, like the proliferation of like medicines and like how much people take drugs basically, like advertising is everywhere and things like that as well. Do you feel it's over the top? Do you feel it's too much in the US? From my basic knowledge, it seems like the pharmaceutical industry in, in America is very unique and it just seems like so over the top overkill man i feel quite quite sorry for americans who have like who just get bombarded with like adverts and basically made to take medicines all the time it seems 16 vote before they can drink worldwide the age at which a person can legally drink alcohol is most commonly 18 the age usually considered to be adulthood though it is even earlier in some countries the voting age on a global scale is also generally 18, for similar reasons. Although, of course, there are exceptions. The Voting Rights Act of 1970 lowered the voting age to 18 for national elections, and the 26th Amendment made the change to 18 permanent for all elections. And 18 is where it has stayed for the past 50 years. However, the United States requires young adults to wait three years after being able to vote before legally being allowed to drink at 21. This was enacted during the 1980s to prevent alcohol-related driving accidents. This law has been an abysmal failure. It hasn't reduced or eliminated drinking. It has simply driven it underground, behind closed doors, into the most risky and least manageable of settings. While it helped in the short term, ultimately it hasn't really stopped teenagers from drinking. The result is that many people, both inside and outside the U.S., Question the logic of why an 18-year-old American can decide who forms the government but not get buzzed. The reality is everyone drinks before they turn 21. That's why when you go out for your first legal drink, you have to react with that faux surprise like you've never heard of alcohol before. <laughs> Ooh, what does this alcohol taste like? Mmm. Oh, it's unusual. Oh, this is true. Number <laughs> That's kind of true, yeah. That, that is another thing that's kind of shocking to me as well. The age being 21 can do so many other things. You can do basically everything else legally, but just alcohol, 21, uh, seems quite old. Obviously, being from the UK, it's 18. I think most people have their first drink when they're like maybe 14 or 15. They go outside, hang around the parks with their friends and just drink. Uh, so people drink very early. Not that that's a good thing, that's actually very irresponsible as well, I guess. Uh, but do you think they could ever lower the age? Do you think they'll ever lower the age of alcohol? Uh, like being able to consume alcohol in America to like say 18 or something like that? Has it been successful? Has it not? It said it wasn't successful there. Uh, is it in your opinion? 15. Get free refills. One of the biggest differences between American restaurants and the rest of the world are their drink services. Most American and many Canadian restaurants and other establishments will offer at least one free refill of a non-alcoholic drink. Refill. Free! I, I just, I, where is it going? The idea is that because of the low cost of drinks, particularly fountain soft drinks, offering a refill won't hurt the establishment's bottom line, particularly if drinks are not the primary source of income. 
However, the idea has been slow to catch on in the rest of the world, and it's nowhere near as consistently offered. Some countries have raised concern that a practice like this can lead to an increase in obesity. Hmm. Number 14, tip service personnel. All right, everybody cough up some green for the little lady. Come on, throw in a buck. Uh-uh, I don't tip. You don't tip? No, I don't believe in it. While the concept of tipping waitstaff or other people in the service industry is known worldwide, few countries have embraced the concept to the degree the U.S. has. Labor movements declare the practice undemocratic and anti-tipping legislation was enacted across several states. But restaurants and rail operators like the Pullman Company embraced tipping because it allowed them, among other things, to hire recently freed slaves without having to pay them. Many workers, Whoa, particularly in the restaurant industry, rely on gratuities to get by, in part because laws allow managers to pay sub-minimum wages to tipped workers. However, in various other countries, tipping is seen as insulting. They're just doing their jobs, after all. Each year, Americans spend $40 billion on tips. That's more than we spend on foreign aid and more than we spend on gambling. And Whoa. Like gambling, it's not entirely clear that tipping makes any sense in the first place. While some countries' workers certainly appreciate it, it isn't expected like it is in the U.S., mostly because employees are paid a high enough baseline salary that they don't need tips to survive. Restaurant owners still pay their servers less than minimum wage, turning what used to be a bribe into an obligation that makes the end of every meal suck. Number 13. Yeah, tell me what you think about that. I've kind of talked about that on previous videos as well. Do you think... There should be a like strictly implemented higher minimum wage to stop waiters and waitresses and other staff having to rely on tips. What's your opinion? Teen, obsess over the military. And I think I speak for the rest of the WWE. I certainly speak for myself. I would like to say thank you to all our men and women who choose to don the uniform of the United States military. The American military is probably the best in the world, as it should be, since it's also one of the best funded militaries in the world. In fact, the U.S. spends several times more on their military than their nearest competitor, China. What's more, there are more than a few American citizens who have a higher than average fascination with their own military and its culture. I thank you as, our, as your commander in chief because you inspire me. Your willingness to serve, to step forward, at a time of war and say, send me, is the reason the United States stays strong and free. While other countries certainly appreciate their troops, you don't, say, see as many people wearing camouflage as a legitimate fashion statement. Likewise, you don't see movies made elsewhere that glorify the military to the degree that the U.S. does. Do me a favor. Tell my children I love them very much. All right, you alien assholes. In the words of my generation, up you! Part of the American enthusiasm is certainly rooted in patriotism. Still, it may also be a reaction to an increasingly anti-military sentiment that has popped up over the last several decades. No war, okay? No war, okay? Oh, well, here you go, boys. These will help you protest. It's good to see that you care about peace, boys. Okay. Number 12. Yeah, I kind of, I think it's good to be patriotic and good to support your military. At the end of the day, these are just men and women who are potentially, or not potentially, but they're putting their life on the line for their country. They should always be supported, in my opinion. They should always be celebrated. And yeah, I think it's... I don't think it's a problem. I think other countries have people who are fiercely proud of their military. I'm from the UK. There's definitely a lot of British people who are proud of our military as well, and quite right, in my opinion. Uh, definitely there's been a growing discontent uh, with war and military as well, but I think there's still probably more people who support militaries rather than not. Use red plastic cups. If you've ever seen an American movie where a college party happens, chances are you've seen characters drinking from red cups. These red plastic or solo cups are everywhere in the US. 
The cheap drinking containers are a favorite at parties, both for their durability and their ease of use in party games. While they're also handy for crafts or gardening, they're most famous for their intended purpose. However, the rest of the world either doesn't have the United States party culture's emphasis on kegs or lacks the same distinctive cups, originally manufactured by the Solo Cup Company. At most, you might see them at a novelty American-themed party. Number 11. Wear Shoes Inside Taking off your shoes before you enter a home, or at least in the entryway, is pretty common etiquette in many countries. Don't do that. Why'd you take your shoes off? So I don't break your nose. And while many Americans do prefer to keep footwear off their floors, it isn't a hard and fast rule like it is in other places. Often, it will depend on whether the person has carpeted floors or hardwood floors, with the latter considered easier to clean. Since it's not considered the norm, though, asking guests to take off their shoes indoors can come across as rude or fussy, and so is often avoided. Number 10. Yeah, that one is, like, definitely in the UK we follow that as well. People wear shoes in the house, but since I moved to Asia, that's an absolute no-no. I never wear my shoes in the house anymore. Even if I go back to the UK, I always take my shoes off just because I've been like brainwashed and never wear shoes in the house. It's just not the done thing in Asian culture. Uh, but yeah, tell me what you think about that one as well. Peanut butter as their go-to spread. Peanuts are grown and eaten in many parts of the world. But it's the United States and Canada that do most of the peanut butter eating. Peanut butter man now, eh, sir? Yes, I believe I am. I thoroughly enjoy this peanut butter. A lot of countries see it as a niche or even unpleasant taste. Others have a spread that is more culturally ingrained like Nutella. The USA cannot get enough of peanut butter, though, consuming over a billion pounds of it annually. January 24th is even National Peanut Butter Day. It's a cheap source of protein that most American children grow up eating, so it's no wonder that it's a comfort food for many of them. Number 9. Work Too Much What's the best crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Americans are workaholics, at least compared to basically every other country in the world. The majority of Americans work more than 40 hours a week. Why do we do this to ourselves? Well, the conventional answer is that this attitude towards work makes the American economy the envy of the world. America is a hectic, turbocharged system that builds, destroys, rebuilds, all at warp speed. They also tend to lack many of the things the rest of the world takes for granted, like paid holidays as well as sick and parental leave. Research has shown that happier, less stressed workers do better at their jobs. Iceland even recently tried a four-day work week that proved wildly successful. There's, there's lots of other benefits to a four-day working week. It's not just the you know, it's not just the, the mental health and, and, and economy, you know, good for the economy. It's also environmental benefits too. You know, evidence looks like when we're commuting less as a result of a four-day week, that brings down emissions. Also, energy consumption goes down. So this is this is this is a policy that's win-win for the environment, for workers, for employers. What's not to like about it? Several European countries take long breaks for lunch. While the American drive is admirable, grind culture becomes problematic when it costs workers their mental health and well-being. Number eight. Yeah, tell me what you think about the American work, work culture. That's definitely an, a topic of interest to me that I want to learn more about because yeah, it's completely different to most other countries. Well, in Europe anyway, Asia has probably more similar mentality to the US where it's just work all day, work all night, uh, always on call basically. I feel like most Americans if they had the choice would rather have work less, would rather have more annual leave, better benefits like that, not have to work so hard but do you think it's that important to the American economy? Do you think the American economy would become more prosperous or be the same if you worked less or had that, say, four-day work week? Do you think a four-day work week could be implemented in the US? I feel for Americans when I hear people tell me how much or how lack, how little annual leave they actually have, like two weeks, things like that, whereas in the UK it can be up to four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. Uh, it seems quite unfair, but yeah, tell me how you think of that being American. Do you... Do you wish you had another work culture? Eight, make small talk with strangers. Americans are known for their friendliness towards strangers, especially outside of big cities. It's not uncommon for Americans to smile at each other in passing, but their comfort with new people also extends to small talk, saying hello or even striking up a conversation out of the blue. If you're seated in an 
emergency exit, bro. Yeah. We feel you would be unable or unwilling to perform the duties listed on the safety card. Please ask a flight attendant to reseat you. In many countries, speaking to strangers unprompted can be seen as intrusive or even risky. Many Americans are masters of the art, though, often happy to chat with people they've never met about the weather, sports, or whatever else comes up in conversation. Looks like a carrot, honey. It looks like a carrot. Hi. Number seven, casually own guns. In many countries, gun laws are strict and gun ownership is relatively rare. In the U.S., gun ownership is protected by the Second Amendment, and gun ownership is the highest in the world. Despite making up 4% of the global population, Americans own 46% of civilian-held firearms. There's a distinct gun culture, where gun ownership is celebrated or at least seen as important for personal safety. Most states even allow you to open carry. Wow. But it's a lucky thing I had my pieces. Your, your pieces? My gun. Oh. Nice. I, anyway, I started blasting. Bah, wow. bah. Of course, the issue is extremely divisive due to the country's high rate of gun deaths. Either way, the idea of having so many guns around is a novel one for many visitors. Guns. Lots of guns. <laughs> Number <six. laughs> Tell me yeah, what you think about that. What side of the debate do you fall on for that? Do you think they should be banned? Do you think it's fine the way it is? Do you think there should be stricter controls on it? What's your opinion of it? Uh, again, only being based outside of the USA, we only see when bad things happen and we get this sort of media narrative about that as well. But I'm really interested to know what normal Americans think about it. Six, put sales tax on everything. Sales tax is paid when you buy something and the business you purchased your goods from sends that money to the government. There are two types of sales tax, general sales tax and excise taxes. General sales tax is a tax levied on most goods you buy. Excise taxes are taxes levied only on certain items. Most countries enact a value added tax or VAT on goods or services purchased within their borders. These taxes are collected from every person in the supply chain, from the distributors to the consumers. The United States is one of the few to use sales tax, which not only vary wildly from state to state, but are only enacted after a purchase has been made. The state treasury depends on sales taxes to pay for road repairs, education, and medical care for children, seniors, and the poor. They're also not listed in the initial price, which can leave foreign visitors and many Americans scratching their head as to why they're being charged more than the price on the product. Better or worse, you decide. It's certainly more confusing. What's the advice then if you're gonna buy a big ticket item where is the cheapest sales tax? Well, you know, you can go online and look at all the sales tax rates for different cities. And, and if you look at one dealership or one, you know, Best Buy yeah. or something like that, you can find the different zip codes and look at the sales tax ah. rates and just see how much that a little take off and then take your family out for a nice night. There you go. Number five, recite a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. In many parts of the United States, school children and adults in some settings are expected to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Back then in 1892 when it was written by Francis Bellamy, Bellamy was a Baptist minister mm -hmm. and in, um, in conjunction with a magazine called The Youth's Companion, uh, he wrote this uh, at that time 23 word Pledge of Allegiance. This is an expression that they will be loyal to the USA and is usually performed daily while looking at the nation's flag, which you will find hanging everywhere, by the way. This isn't something other countries do. They might salute or respect their flag and country, but to make school children recite an oath to the country? The pledge has been the subject of plenty of controversy within the US too, particularly since it mentions God. While some schools no longer require it, it remains a widespread practice. Bottom line is, um, we all look different, sound different, but we are all on the same team. Number four. Yeah, I guess I can see like the good points about that is, yeah, making, I guess it kind of brings people together. Again, they mentioned there that maybe less schools are doing it. Is that a thing? Is it becoming less common for that to be carried out in schools? What do you think about it? Do you think it should be an important part of like life for these children? Do you think they should have to do it? Uh, I know that in Asia, different countries have different ways of thing, doing things, like they'll sing the national anthem in school in the morning, things like that as well. So 
America, yeah, probably the only place to have this sort of pledge, but other countries do have other ways they show patriotism to their country in school as well. Watch ads for prescription drugs. Aside from New Zealand, the United States is the only country in the world that advertises prescription drugs directly to consumers. Every day, Americans are bombarded with ads for prescription medications, featuring generic, pleasing imagery and a list of side effects longer than a flagpole. Side effects may include upper respiratory infection, stuff your runny nose, and sore throat and headache. Many people, Americans included, are baffled by the practice, as doctors and not patients are meant to decide what drugs to prescribe. Proponents claim that advertising increases competition and lowers drug costs. Meanwhile, prescription drugs are typically far more expensive in the United States, as the U.S. doesn't regulate or negotiate drug prices. Number three. Yeah, that's the one I really can't understand. I feel like sorry for Americans like being like bombarded or having these sort of things. Like the whole point of adverts is to try and get you interested in a product. I guess to spread awareness sometimes, but it's like basically to get you to know that company so you can use their products. I can get that for a lot of other products when it comes to prescription drugs for medicine. I just don't understand it should be only things you need when you really, or it should only be things you use when there's a necessity for it. That one just is strange. I've never seen it in any other country, that sort of uh, promotion of drugs. Uh, tell me what you think about but that. months before days. Most of humanity hmm. marks calendar dates as being day first, then month, then year. It's the date. Assuming the first two numbers are some big old space date, then you've got year, month, day. It's the other way around like it is in America. Oh! Or else the opposite <laughs> as year, month, then day. The reasoning is that you can go from the shortest value to the longest or vice versa. Yet the United States and parts of Canada eschew both these formats by putting the month first, then day, then year. The U.S. has been using this format basically since its founding, although it has used the day first format interchangeably too. The exact reason why is debatable, but as far as practicality goes, it can be useful when filling out forms to know which month it is before which day or year. Number two, go bankrupt from healthcare. Hmm. Medical costs are the cause of over 60% of all bankruptcies in the United States. In 2017, one third of the money raised on GoFundMe went towards medical campaigns. And the site raises $650 million a year for more than 250,000 medical campaigns. Americans Jeez. experience a variety of unexpected charges while getting much needed care, from surprise bills to being charged for riding in an ambulance. According to one study, 71% of all ambulance providers do not take the patient's insurance. That same study found that 79% of patients who took an ambulance could get a surprise bill, with an average total around $450. In some parts of the civilized world, even seeing a medical bill can be an uncommon occurrence. Healthcare worldwide tends to be much more regulated than it is in the U.S. It's either funded through taxes in a single-payer system or else through individual insurers who are more strictly monitored. Other countries, they, they don't have this problem. Instead of every private insurance company negotiating with every healthcare provider, there's just this big list. Country, the central government, they go and they say, if you want to sell to us, to all of our people, then here's what you can charge for a checkup. Here's what you can charge for an MRI or a prescription for Lipitor. Bottom line, while there can sometimes be extra charges, for most of the world, medical debt is basically unheard of, except in horror stories about the U.S. Can't get a credit card. I can't buy a house. I don't see me ever being out of debt. Before we continue. Yeah, that one, I, I that's the one that kind of scares me about America. If I was ever to move to America, it would be, that would probably be the one thing that would kind of put me off a little bit is just, I hear so many horror stories of healthcare and the costs associated with it in the US. It can be like crazy hundreds of thousands of dollars. Tell me what you think about it. Is there any possibility that America could follow other countries and just have completely free healthcare where you don't have to think about the, like getting a bill or something like that, where you just have to go in get seen, get checked over, get fixed, and then go back out without any sort of knowledge of the cost. Uh, what would it take to actually implement that sort of system in America? Do pharmaceutical companies hold too much power for that to happen? Uh, being from the UK, we have NHS, I've used them before a couple of times, not many to be honest, but it's like, 
maybe not the best service. It can take long to be seen and things, but it's all free. You don't have to worry about it being costly or having that effect sure on your life. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your set Imperial Measurement System. Can you explain to me yes. how the country that can send um, men and hopefully women to the moon yeah, all and still beyond. are in gallons and inches? Mm. And when the entire world is metric, I do not understand this. There are three countries in the world that don't use the metric system. Myanmar, Liberia, and the United States. Objectively, metric is the less arbitrary measurement system since everything goes by tens. Even Britain and Commonwealth countries have converted. The point is, the US system has always been a little more accessible than metric. Sure, stacking up 12 thumb widths to make a foot, that's still kind of weird, but it's not so weird that we're clamoring to change it. Although admittedly, they do still use measurements like feet and inches casually. So now I can't ask a distance when I visit another country. I'm like, how far is that? They're like, that's 500 kilometers. I'm not in the Olympics. <laughs> so why has the US converted? <laughs> I'll give you one guess. Did you say it's because of money? Because money is definitely a big factor. Converting to a whole new system of measurement is expensive. Other factors include a need for control and stability of the US. So inertia, basically. Why change when you don't need to? Mm. You know what your mom says. If all the other countries jumped off a bridge, would the US do it too? <laughs> or something like that. A 2015 Rasmussen poll asked Americans if we should switch to the metric system and adopt Celsius as our main temperature scale. 64% said no, while 21% said yes, and the remaining 15% was undecided. So it looks like we're perfectly fine with being different. Did you enjoy... Yeah, so tell me what you think about that. Do you think you can ever envisage a time when you change system? Do you see any benefits to it? Would you want to yourself? I mean, Liberia, Myanmar, and the USA, that's just an interesting list of countries that use and a, a system that's very important in a way, like, quite mad that it's something that connects those three countries, but tell me what you think about those list, that list, do you think that's things that only Americans do, do you do all of those things, do you agree with them, do you disagree with any, uh, tell me in the comments, thanks.